Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joyce Harris, and I will be the moderator for today's Ask the Expert webinar, Online Learning, Teaching Students How to Work from Home. Today's webinar is brought to you by Chad's National Resource Center on ADHD. Our mission is to improve the lives of people affected by ADHD. If we are unable to address your question, please feel free to contact Chad and one of our health information specialists will provide you with information and resources. Welcome, Ezra. Thank you so much, Joyce and Chad. Um, it's really a pleasure uh, that I get to do this and talk about this topic on online learning, teaching students how to work from home, which I know, you know we're here because this is uh, a stressful situation that we've all been thrown in, right? Teachers, parents, and students alike we're all working from home, <laughs> which is why um, I'm, I'm, I try to call it that. Uh, you know, both in a symbolic sense, it kind of ties us a little bit more to these students, but also in a literal sense, you know, their academic lives are really starting to resemble um, adult working lives, um, people who work um, in office type settings or, or use the computer. You know, all our work and so much of our um, adult lives are now uh, online and we use apps um, and, and support ourselves through these sorts of um, these venues. So, you know, I'm hoping I can bring a little bit of, of positivity to this situation um, and show you that, uh, how we can kind of look at this as an opportunity. So I just want to talk about educational therapy for a minute because a lot of people still haven't heard of it. Um, the educational therapy approach is to create change by alleviating fears and boosting self-esteem by providing opportunities for incremental successes. So these are the tenets that as EdPists we kind of stick by. Um, we're working um, in academic situations where, you know, helping with schoolwork, providing opportunities for um, our own original type of um, projects we do with them. But the whole point is to alleviate the anxiety um, that students have built up over the years um, through their struggles uh, and make them confident. Because we know working from a place of confidence and strength um, is, is so much more conducive to them being successful. Um, and providing incremental successes, opportunities for students to build incremental successes is something that I take very seriously. And um, I'll certainly be referring to all these things throughout this presentation. So what I have done over these years is working one-on-one -on -one with students outside the classroom, um, communicating with teachers and brainstorming um, with parents as well, how we can best um, support these students. So this is what online learning often ends up looking like these days, right? Their whole social and entertainment world is a click away now. Uh, and for people, and look, you know, adults might have this problem too, uh, which is going to be a common theme here. Um, I certainly do. Um, the, the sort of impulse control we have to exercise and the sorts of planning ahead and foreseeing kind of consequences that we have to do in order to realize, okay, we have business to take care of. But when it's just a click away, this is kind of a new situation from a student being in, in the classroom, right? So this is one big thing that um, I'm often hearing from parents is how to get them to not be on social media and on video games or whatever um, whilst they're trying to, to, to do uh, academic work. Uh, another important thing, um, just as a base to jump off from, you know, we, it's always important for us to realize that learning environments um, play a key component in, in how students with uh, executive function challenges and attention challenges um, you know, succeed. Uh, you know, lacking physical movement in space is a real challenge for them. We know that when they're in more open environments, green environments, as um, is, uh, he says in Neurodiversity in the Classroom, which is a great book, um, ADHD symptoms are, are less pronounced. So when they're in classrooms, there's a lot more stimuli, they're in a confined space, and the, the challenges that are coming at them fast and furious um, it's, it's a tax on their executive functions for sure. And now they're in their rooms, which is kind of their new classroom office space. Um, and again, it's confining. There's a lot of distractions. Um, they might feel comfortable in there, which great, which might reduce anxiety, but, but certainly the idea of, of being attentive to, to classwork and their assignments becomes challenging. So just as a quick, a quick tip, you know, as much as we can get students outside these days, um, I think is important, whether it's, if they happen to, to have a laptop, you know, working outside, which I used to do with um, my students in Southern California, we could do that all year. We were lucky. Um, I would often take students outside to work or if they're working on some sort of project. Um, but, but even just, um, you know, having them take breaks and getting outside to do some exercise is obviously very important. Um, but, you know, the big issue with, 
with learning, both, both classroom learning and um, certainly this new situation we're in, uh, are executive functions, right? We've all kind of read about these. Um, we, um, we, you know, it, it seems like more and more these days people are talking about executive functions. It's becoming more of a common thing. I prefer George McCloskey's model of executive functions. Uh, he has 24 ones that he highlights and they're in tiers and his writing can be very complex. Um, so I've kind of just pulled out 10 that I think are kind of key musicians in the orchestra conducting our mind. That's the uh, metaphor that I prefer. Um, so, you know, we have initiating our thinking and our perceptions and our ideas, like from a, from a stop position to getting going, organizing our thoughts, perceptions, and ideas, uh, managing our time and being aware of time in the midst of possibly doing work, um, inhibiting impulses, um, self-monitoring and correcting our mistakes, which I call holding up a mirror, um, being uh, flexible in our minds and being able to shift our thoughts, ideas, and perceptions when new information is presented, planning ahead, setting goals, foreseeing consequences, uh, focusing and selecting, which is kind of picking the, the, the key points out of your environment or a lesson or even possibly a social interaction you're having with someone. How do you pick out kind of the main things to take away, right? And modulating our mental energy and effort. Sometimes students and all people, um, sometimes people you know, have two speeds, uh, race, car, and stop. Right, so learning how to, about our mental energy and how to kind of modulate it. And storing, retrieving information is, you know, working memory, long-term memory, and, and memory retrieval, right? So if you think um, half of these are challenging for a person, that's going to make um, certainly classroom environments and, you know, working from home very difficult. That's going to make the song challenging to come out the way we want it to. And, and the, another big point here I want to make is we all have executive functions going for us at all times. Um, every kid, all of us. So some of us are going to be stronger in some of these than others. I know I have a profile for sure. I'm looking at some of these, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I can see that there are ones that I, that I definitely need support with. So, you know, a lot of, or all of the strategies and, and things I'm going to be talking about, you know, they apply to me, they apply to every student really, um, and possibly uh, apply to you as well. So I think it's cool to, to kind of look at uh, our executive functions that way. So what can we do to support them? What am I talking about here? So I'm going to posit my thesis to you, which is that online digital tools, this kind of situation we're in, um, the opportunities that they're presenting offer um, an opportunity to foster independence for these students, right? We're talking about how the adult, our, us adults are working from home and we're independent as we do that. And we're using all these sorts of online tools and strategies for our own executive functions. This is an opportunity for us to, to help kids take those steps. Um, so it seems like a contradiction, right? Because we're here because um, them being independent right now is a challenge. And as teachers and parents, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can support them and get them towards independence. Well, this is why we first need to provide support, modeling, and, and give accommodations with the ultimate goal that we're gonna step away and they're gonna take control, right? So I always say, as an educational therapist, I'm working myself out of the job. You know, as I reduce days with a student and they take control, that's when I know um, things are going well, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about learning management systems, online classroom portals. I am not the expert of this, but we've all sort of had to, we've had to really learn how to use these things very quickly, a huge adjustment. I will say, you know, in the last six or seven years, both my students, who I see um, after school uh, in public schools and private schools, I've been seeing a trend where teachers are more often getting up and running on these. So I think we're in has kind of thrust us forward the future, but I do think things were moving this way um, anyway, one way or another. So I just have a couple of tips I wanna talk about with these. One is I do think teachers should give students a full tour, a full tutorial of these, um, um, these portals uh, oftentimes, I've sat with my students who've been assigned, um, you know, they're up and running on classroom, and we're looking at their assignments and know where everything is, and they're still learning how to navigate. So, you know, I've talked to teachers who they are um, spending the first week or two just getting their students acclimated to these systems, even if they've seen it last year. and taught kids how to do this, they, um, it didn't necessarily take immediately,
but I think this is um, worth pursuing. Um, certainly if you're a student, really try this, this technique out. And if you're a teacher or you're a parent, try um, teaching them how to do this and modeling it for them and reinforcing it. So, you know, as a teacher, if we're talking about the first couple of weeks of school, maybe this is one of these, you know, beginning assignments that they can practice um, doing this sort of thing. Uh, using a digital calendar um, is another one I think uh, is really important. Often these LMS systems, they provide for you a to-do list, which is really cool. There's that inherent um, organization built in. Um, but I, I also teach my students how to use digital calendars, whether it's Google Calendar or Apple Calendar. Um, I think it's another one that's important um, in the big picture, getting students to realize that you know, once you become an adult, you want to be checking in with your weeks, right? You want to be able to foresee you know, what's coming up um, and set goals for yourself. So this is another one that I think incrementally um, uh, is an important skill that they, that they learn. Okay, so the rest is going to be mainly um, for educators, although parents and students um, you should clearly be attentive to this and I'll kind of wrap it up um, with that later on. But building, building in incremental steps for assignments. So often when we get to middle school, high school and beyond, we're talking about bigger projects here. Um, projects that require multiple steps and multiple days. Um, so what I advise um, teachers to do is break up these assignments, not just um, kind of casually, but actually give them credit, like um, class credit, um, grade credit, and positive reinforcement for each step. So almost like treating each incremental um, step as a separate project. Um, this literally is, is breaking things up into incremental steps. I'm going to give you kind of an extreme example. I had a student last year who uh, writing, creative writing was extremely challenging. He actually just could not do it for, for lots of reasons, including social emotional. But I spoke with the teacher and we discussed how, well, at least if he could brainstorm ideas and create an outline that would be sufficient for this project given his challenges. And that's exactly what happened. And instead of the students seeing an F in the portal, which now you see grades given in real time in those portals, um, he saw that um, he did well on it, um, even though he didn't get to finish the, the other steps. So obviously the big picture is we would love to get this student to actually write stories because he is a very creative kid as most of these or all of these students are. Um, but this actually helped him gain confidence that this was something that possibly he could build upon. Um, okay, so I think this is another one where the, we have an opportunity here because the way that students communicate now is, is online. It's direct messaging, it's digital, right? So I've had a lot of students that really struggle to um, engage with their teachers in person and raise their hands and advocate for themselves. But I've seen these same kids given the opportunity to, whether it's email or direct messaging through the, the portal or just with comments back and forth on Google Docs or Google Slides or what have you, they, they're engaging with their teachers more. Um, so giving them positive feedback and encouragement and of course constructive critique as well creates engagement and connection with them in a format that we previously didn't have. So, you know, and I think this is something that, that students typically feel more comfortable with. Um, and it's a great way to communicate with them. And obviously teaching students how to like write proper emails, uh, formal emails is something I, I've done with students. Okay, so thinking about um, some of the kind of comorbid learning challenges students have, I think like the statistic is 60% uh, of students or people diagnosed with, with ADHD have other learning challenges as well. And the one that kind of sticks out to me usually uh, are learning cha um, language challenges, uh, both expressive and receptive. So we're talking about reading and writing here generally. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of supports that over the years I have seen just work so successfully with students. And a lot of teachers already pick, um, you know, have picked up on this and, and include these, uh, but not always. So I've, I've spoken with teachers and parents about this. Audiobooks can be extremely effective. Uh, Gene Wolfson is a researcher who says, audiobooks um, teach the same uh, language comprehension skills as a student just reading on their own. Um, I treat audiobooks like training wheels. Um, I have students follow along with the text as well, which usually they want to do anyway. And what usually happens is, you know, they get the auditory support 
for a few novels, maybe this lasts a couple of years, uh, especially if they're auditory learners, this is especially helpful. And then after a year or two, usually what they say is, I don't need those anymore. You know, um, and that's a great aha moment when, oh my gosh, they're taking control now. Um, another one is, uh, you know, this sort of short form videos that are all over the internet now. Course Hero is one website um, that, I, that I think is great. And uh, John Green, the author, has a website, has a YouTube channel called Crash Course, where he does videos on all sorts of stuff. There's, there's tons of these. Um, you know, students are often intimidated when they're given a nonfiction textbook or a big article to read or a novel, right? They're reticent to start. Um, it's a lot of language to process. Even if, even if language isn't their specific challenge and it's just kind of the intent challenge, using uh, our mental energy like that to read in, you know, chapters at a time or to sift through difficult academic language. Having uh, what I call these are a movie trailer, right? So when we go see a movie, we so often see the trailer before, right? And we know who's in it and we know um, who the main, um, you know, we know who the stars are. Um, so giving um, them this sort of trailer type situation to give them a base to jump off from so that they feel more confident when they have to attack the writing. I, again, I mean the reading. I see this work so often. Um, again, a lot of teachers are doing this more these days, um, but um, so often I, I find these videos for the students and it's, it's so helpful. Obviously these should not be replacements for reading. We want students to gain those skills of processing uh, you know, a lot of language. But again, this is a great jumping off point. And I've never had a student treat these as a replacement. Um, my students always want, they have the, the motivation and the desire to want to read. Um, and, and especially after they see the videos, which kind of hooks them in. Um, Safe YouTube is something you should know about. Look it up. It's a cool um, kind of feature so that you can take away the, the ads and things like that when you post the, um, a YouTube video. And post read too. Um, after they read, getting to watch a short form video um, can be very helpful to kind of sum up the finer points. Slideshows, same thing. So I love slideshows. I'm kind of obsessed with them. Um, this is one that I pulled off the internet for the outsiders that I used with a student. And here's one for fridge. So we're talking about nonfiction and fiction or you know, science, whatever you teach, giving them slideshows before they have more complex reading can be very helpful. Oh, and one more thing. I'm just going to go back a slide quickly. Um, when we're talking about nonfiction texts, um, things online that they're reading, whether they be PDFs, you know, a lot of computers now have the function built in where it'll read it to you. Okay. So, and there are apps you can download to your, your computers that will serve that function. So when I've had students assigned slideshows from their teachers, they're so much more engaged than they, than they are when they have to stare at a long, scary blank Word document and just start kind of typing out ideas in 12 point font. I think it's scary for any of us to have to do that, but slideshows alleviate that. It allows them to choose their backgrounds and pick fonts and choose the right pictures to express what they want to express. Um, and it, it alleviates anxiety because they don't, they don't have the burden of having to compose huge paragraphs, right? They can pick out the finer points, um, use sentences, but put them more in bullet form. So here's an example of a student that um, he was given a slideshow project. And this is a student that really struggled to write out even multiple sentences, much less paragraphs or essays. But the slideshow um, medium really made him feel comfortable. And this was the most I'd seen him produce. Um, he did this whole thing about the Cold War, and he loves choosing the background and the title font and the colors and being able to just output these kind of short form um, facts that he researched um, in outline format really prompted him to, to move forward on this project. And here's the coolest part. So he didn't realize he was going to have to present this to the class, but when he found that out, he actually was motivated to then output all of this writing for each slide because he knew he was going to have to speak about it and he didn't want to speak off the cuff. So this project worked on so many different levels. It was an incremental step for him to just get his ideas down and be creative in the slideshow. And then that was a jumping off point for him to actually write more about this topic um, because he knew he was going to have to speak it out. So slideshow kind of made that all possible. Uh, using their interests and strengths. So Dr. Robert Brooks, um, he came up with the idea of islands of competence. You should look up his writing. He's very inspiring. And he writes about how um, people with, with uh, physical challenges, cognitive challenges, whatever, um, they really benefit from having these islands of competence. Everyone has things they're good at and areas of interests. 
And we, if we can um, have the kids spend time um, with those in an academic sense, we're going to see engagement and we're going to see reduced anxiety and increased confidence. I see it all the time. Um, so if we're talking about music or uh, you know, TV or movies or skateboarding or fashion design or sports, somehow, and I know this is easier kind of said than done, it's something we have to think about as educators, how can we include these things and give kids opportunities to use um, what they know already in projects, whether they be daily, nightly projects or long term? And moving uh, more on to those two bottom pictures, um, their strengths. Students now are so good at these sorts of new technologies. They're, they're ahead of us, let's be honest. So they know how to create podcasts. They know how to video blog. This is inherent in the way that they communicate and express themselves, and it's part of their entertainment. So you know, when I have seen students given these sorts of assignments, the engagement goes sky high. I had a student that um, really struggled to write. Um, in ninth grade, when I met him, he, he didn't even, it seemed like he had never even encountered a five paragraph essay and he was already being tasked with that. But there was one project that the teacher gave that was a podcasting project and suddenly he was writing up a storm and he was allowed to write about um, skate, skateboarding culture in LA. I think it related to their class curriculum um, and I'd never seen him produce so much writing. So sometimes these can provoke a student by, um, to write more, more because it's a medium that they're comfortable with and that they're good at. It works to their strengths. It allows them to be creative. Um, and the, the flip side is, let's say they're better at just expressing themselves off the cuff. Um, and that's kind of how they want to do this assignment. You could reverse engineer where then they take those projects and then they type out transcripts of what they've spoken out. Right? So there's different ways that um, we can still have the students practice expressive language and expressing themselves in writing, but just use di these different formats that they're more comfortable with. Uh, and one, one more quick thing, for students that struggle with um, typing, speech-to-text apps are so good, they're very accurate, and um, they actually prompt you to speak out the punctuation too, which is cool, because then the student has to think about kind of how they want to structure their sentence and help them organize their thoughts. So another thing just to keep in mind, these, are very, these can be very, very helpful. Uh, fostering self-advocacy is kind of the bigger picture here. Um, if you're a student, start adapting these sorts of strategies and apps and advocate for yourself to teachers and to your parents. If you need support or if you need an alternate assignment or you have an idea how to work in one of your interests, you be vocal about it. Message your teachers through the app, send an email, advocate for yourself, right? Um, so here are key takeaways. Digital organization and clarity, time management and breaks, chopping up assignments, options for writing assignments that work with their strengths and interests, online resources for reading support, like the videos and slideshows, and frequent feedback and communication. So when I've seen all these things employed with students as they get into middle school, high school, college, I've seen students move quicker towards independence. Um, I've seen it. Um, um, so these are kind of the ones that I've picked out um, that I think are, are key. Um, and of course, our big takeaway is getting them towards independence, right? We want to be, um, we don't want them to be relying on us. Uh, we want them to be adapting these tools to their own repertoire and using them. Um, so here's um, some references if you want to read up more about any of some of the things I mentioned. Um, and this is my book, Teach for Attention. Um, Free Spirit is the publisher. They're great. They have all sorts of um, educational academic materials for students and teachers. So you can check that out. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ezra, for providing our participants with very helpful information during this time. Um, I hope I wasn't um, cut out for too long. I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> the internet, you know, unfortunately that's an issue that we're all, we're all dealing with too, right? Okay, we are back. And the first question for you, Ezra, are there any good motivation strategies we can use to keep our kids motivated and active in online learning? Um, I think uh, motivation often comes from um, an interest they might have in the material. Um, so again, I always encourage teachers to somehow work in um, things that students are interested in and motivate them. A student who had the podcast project, he was, I, I, I don't remember what the topic of the, of, you know, the, the course was, what the theme, but I know it, you know, being able to engage with 
I think it was like skate culture and fashion in Los Angeles. It's somehow tied into the bigger picture. I don't remember how, but I'm telling you, I've never seen a kid so motivated. So, you know, um, when they feel like their interests are relevant um, and you know, a teacher, even engaging with a student about their interests in a casual sense um, and somehow making any sort of connections, um, the motivation goes sky high. That's the most we see students for sure. Um, and also, again, you know, using um, mediums and venues that they're strong in. You know, I think a lot of times motivation um, for students that have challenges, whether they be ADHD or whatever, um, comes from them feeling confident. You know, that's why I keep emphasizing that sort of anxiety confidence um, scenario. We want kids to go into these assignments and, and new learning as confident beings. Right? I mean, think about us. Like when we're shaky about something, we're, we're less apt to engage with it. It's, it. it's kind of a pervasive thing. And when they're more engaged, um, they're more apt to be motivated to engage further. That's what I've found. Um, we're talking about motivating like external rewards. Again, certainly teaching students to, to motivate themselves using their own rewards, whether that's breaks or, you know, whatever they can come up with for themselves. You know, in a sense, they sort of have to, and I know, again, this is easier said than done, but come up with their own motivation strategies for themselves. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, I have another parent who's asking, what are some strategies as a parent um, to use to have a plan for completing a task at hand or maybe homework assigned without the parent having to regulate the student's access to specific applications in the internet itself? Well, so uh, the whole issue with them being, uh, having to control their impulses while they're doing work, that's the number one that I do hear um, from parents that's challenging and I see it. You know, I, and I can imagine that's challenging because it's challenging for me <laughs> when I'm trying to get stuff done. Oh my gosh, I'm constantly clicking over to check you know, my email or check, you know, sports scores. Celtics game is on right now. It's all I can do to not click over and see the Celtics score. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's a very challenging thing. If a student can work off of the computer from something and, you know, this is another one I've talked to parents a lot about is I always advise if the room, if a student's room is not conducive to them um, controlling their impulses and being able to work, they need to find another space. Whether it's a workspace in the house, or like I said, on the back porch, that maybe is a bit more free of distractions where they can get some fresh air. I mean, back before this, I used to always encourage students to go to the library. I would often meet with students in the library. Um, having an alternative location, one maybe that's more open and free of distractions, um, can be very very um, useful. Now, a lot of students will be, you know, um, insistent that they want to work in their room. Um, and some of them, and, and this is another thing to keep in mind, sometimes things, I didn't mention this in the webinar, but things like music, having headphones on with music can help students. I've seen it. I know a lot of people think that, well, a student listening to music is, is going to be distracted, but that might help them. Those sorts of sensory um, sort of in that case, I guess you're depriving outside sensory stuff so that you can just hear the music can be soothing um, to some students. Um, encouraging the student to set incremental goals for themselves. So if they, have, if they have to write two paragraphs tonight or do research about something and type up some answers to questions, you know, encouraging them to break up that assignment and take breaks in between and again, reward themselves um, in between. And certainly using timers and giving themselves time limits. Again, all the stuff I know, I know because I've seen it is easier said than done, but these are the sorts of things we should be, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's something we have to keep practicing with them and working on with them. Um, I have another parent who's asking, what rewards do you recommend specifically for middle and high school students? I, I mean, I, I guess that depends on the student. Certainly when we're talking about these sort of self rewards, they need to be able to extract themselves from whatever reward they're, they're, they're giving themselves. Um, or getting from a parent so that they can go back to work at some point, right? Um, so, you know, when I actually um, have sessions with students and we employ the strategy and we model it, you know, oftentimes it'll be a little game that they just want to check out quickly online. Now, if they're going into big gaming portal where they're playing, you know, 
or Fortnite or whatever, that's probably going to be too engrossing and they won't be able to extract themselves. So, you know, in my sessions, they're usually like little quick games, um, either on an iPad or online that, that are short, that last only five to 10 minutes, you know, or I mean, even the re rewarding themselves with, with checking social media and sending some messages to friends, which is a highly rewarding thing for them. Um, I didn't talk about this, but, you know, video games and messaging with friends, these are things that are, are very, um, uh, the, they like doing these things because you're getting immediate satisfaction from it, right? Um, maybe it's boosting your confidence, but you're getting immediate rewards. When you play a video game, it's, it's you know, getting those endorphins going, um, that dopamine, because you, you're getting immediate, you know, rewards from it. And the same thing with, with chatting with friends, right? So, you know, if those are things that they um, enjoy doing, and those can be kind of rewards that they can employ amidst their work and come back from those, that's certainly helpful. I mean, and physical breaks, I mean, if they can see, you know, going outside and doing something outside as a break, I mean, if they're into a sport, they could go do their activity for a little while, uh, taking a walk. I mean, anything that gets their body moving, um, I would say is, is even better if that's something that they see as a reward. I have another parent who, I believe she just wants your, your opinion on the matter. Um, is it better to have your child um, complete their schooling in their bedroom or in another quiet room in the house? Right. So that's, so this is a question that comes up a lot. Um, oftentimes parents and students come to me and there's been a fight about this, right? Um, and the same thing with, uh, with the idea of like listening, a kid listening to music or, I mean, look, some people might work better. I know this sounds crazy, but a student might work better if they have you know, a little video going in the corner while they're working. I know that sounds impossible, but sometimes it works for me. <laughs> so, you know, the idea of where a student works best, obviously the proof is sort of in the pudding. Like if a student is not accomplishing work and they're only sticking in their room and it's just not happening, the parent and the student needs to have, need to have a discussion about that and be like, look, this is, I'm not making this up, this is happening. So let's designate this in the house. Typically, students don't want people hovering over their shoulder, which is probably one of the reasons they want to be in their rooms, is just not having you know, eyes on them. So if you can designate another place outside of the room where they can still you know, feel like they they're, um, have privacy, but don't have the overall distractions of the room that might pull them away, I mean, that's sort of the ideal. Um, but again, if if a student works better and they're more comfortable in their room and they can say listen to music while they're working and that's helpful then I think fine so it certainly depends on the student and what's working but I think the discussion to have between a parent and a student and look maybe a teacher can be involved in this is what has worked for you you know the whole point of this is what works better for you student right so if you're a student and you've had these discussions with your parents you got to be honest with yourself and with them about what does work and what um, and come to some sort of compromise about where a better workspace might be. Um, so this okay. is specifically for students who present as quiet and reserved, at least until you get to know them, right? And so online, right. that can be mistakenly translated as disinterest or maybe even grumpiness. And so a parent is asking specifically for that type uh, of student, any suggestions for social strategies in a Zoom or in whatever type of video platform uh, the school could be using? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. Um, certainly students who are quiet and reserved um, or grumpy, you know, th they might not be meaning to come off that way, first of all. Um, and the truth is they might be uncomfortable with this interface um, and, and being in this sort of online video conference. It just might be something that might be inherently challenging for them. Um, certainly, uh, you know, allowing them to turn off their video might be helpful. And I know then it seems like, well, then we can't check in with them. Um, I think having some sort of um, checking in, like we were talking about earlier, um, with messaging or, you know, send, um, being able to directly message them, which you often can do in Zoom or apps, you know, um, so a teacher can speak to a student about this, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. You know, I would encourage a teacher to engage with this student, perhaps, um, in a solo chat. Um, I work with a student that goes to a school where teachers are often doing that. Um, it's a school for, for twice exceptional children. And they, um, teachers um, 
often set meetings with the students one on one. And what I've seen is, you know, I, I have students in my therapy practice that present um, very similar to what you're describing. And when they have those one on one meetings with the teacher, a lot of times those can those things um, start to go away as a student feels more comfortable um, and they can work out with the teacher um, how the student can um, present themselves in some way that they show that they're listening. So again, whether the, the student is sending a message to a teacher in a Zoom chat or in the portal chat um, or doing some sort of check-in where the student might not necessarily have to present uh, with their face bright and smiley because that just might not be in their nature. They might feel uncomfortable with that. So I think, um, you know, taking into consideration what, um, why the student might be um, kind of exhibiting that is important. Where are they at social emotionally? And a teacher kind of um, taking the opportunity to maybe meet with him or her um, in a one-on-one -on -one scenario and kind of discussing this and figuring out perhaps a system between them where they can check in with the student and make sure they're comprehending and getting the important points. And so part one is um, a child becoming lost or even flustered because of all the tabs that continue to yeah. open. Part two is um, the online reading is difficult, not the active reading, but remembering where a child read something, right? Because it's endless scrolling. So it's not like it's a book where they can say, oh, I remember I read it on this page or at this point in the book. So mom is asking for any tools or tips that you have in both of those capacities? For, you know, for all these years, having sat next to students and looked at their, their computers with them, whether at home or whether it's a laptop elsewhere at school, what have you, I've seen students along with that desktop image where it was just a smattering of icons. Another one that I see is students getting caught up in, in open tabs. So this is a really interesting topic. Um, I have a student that, and, and actually I've seen several students that they like keeping open all of their tabs and they treat their tabs like their bookmarks. So this is, this is important. I've actually, I've never had this question and, and I'm thinking it through right now because uh, this is a tough one. Kind of navigating all the different pages that a student might have to deal with in a given lesson or in a given day. And then on top of that, a scrolling reading that they might have to come back to and then they lose their place. These are excellent questions. Um, they're very, you know, on in the now questions that we're all having to figure out. Um, I haven't employed the strategy of having students use bookmarks. I would say that would be a good one. It's, it's one that I do. Um, I've never encountered a student had trouble with those tabs, but I, again, I can easily imagine that happening. So, I'm going to advise that you teach the kid how to use bookmarks, teach the student or your, your child how to use bookmarks. That will alleviate having so many tabs open. And the bookmarks, if you don't know how they work, when you're in a browser, whether it's Safari or Fox, Google, whatever, you can set bookmarks to pages. And then what it does is it creates a list of saved pages you have. And it's pretty much what the page is. So there, it's usually not, diff, it's not difficult to like decipher what the pages are in the list. It'll say what it is, uh, mo most usually. So that would be, I would say, a strategy to employ so that a student doesn't have to keep all these tabs open and keep switching, that they just close their tabs, have one tab open at a time if possible, or a couple. I mean, I tend to keep two or three open at a time. I think that's manageable. But to close out everything else, but before they close them out, set, it, set a bookmark. So then when they need to go back and look for something that they previously were working on, they can just go to their bookmark scroll and open whichever one they want. That's question number one. Question number two, that's really interesting. Um, hmm. If it's just like a scrolling web page, I mean, if it's a PDF, you can annotate a PDF. Um, so if, if that's the case, a student can, can use the annotate function and they can mark you know, where they were reading from. If we're just talking about like a scrolling web page, that's the tough one. I would say um, post-its. Post-its is another one I encourage kids to use. They can jot down um, the kind of maybe last words they were reading or, you know, number the, uh, look at the numbered uh, paragraphs and they could say, oh, well, I was six paragraphs down. So I'm going to jot six, down six paragraphs and write the words that uh, were the next things I needed to read. Um, and, and along with post-its on their computers, I use 
um, digital post-its. They call them stickies in Apple um, or notes. And I type in all those little pieces of information like that into my, my computer now. So I use physical post-its, but I also use digital post-its, um, which are readily accessible and they're kind of fun to use. And that can also help with kind of, they can jot down again where they were in the reading. Those are really good questions. I hadn't thought about those. Um, so good, good, good asking. And I hope I came up with some sort of solutions for you. Uh, the, the parent here wants your thoughts. So okay. how much time um, should you allot for children engaging in content that isn't something they're interested in in order to get to what they're interested in? Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is as much as I advocate for, for including students in projects, I know it's something that can't be possible all the time, right? And look, life isn't like that. Oftentimes we have to engage in things, taxes, doing the dishes, whatever it may be that maybe isn't our favorite activity, we have to learn to push through um, and do that. So as far as the, the amount of time, again, this is a conversation um, that to have with students and they should be actively involved in trying to figure out their own mental energy, right? So let's say they have, there's a novel that they just, they're just not into, it's not of interest to them, it's boring to them. You know, how much can they withstand reading at once before they have to take a break, right? Um, so it might not be a full chapter at once. Um, oftentimes when I know my students have challenges with this and they're tasked with reading a novel, you know, I advise them, I say, look, you might not be able to read the whole chapter at once, break it up and give yourself those rewards. As far as how much time, that's gonna depend on every student, right? Like I'm saying for myself, um, you know, when I have to do something that I have no interest in doing, oftentimes I find it's like a half an hour. Um, a student might not be able to make it that long. So, you know, and again, we want them to be operating at their optimal mental energy level um, when they're engaging the material, right? Because if, if, if they're feeling taxed and they're attempting to say read something or produce you know, writing of their own, whatever it may be, it's, it's not gonna come if they're feeling overwhelmed and like it's too much. So again, you know, along with becoming independent and fostering this self, their self-advocacy, they need to start figuring these, these things out. Um, how much time they can designate towards a task that maybe isn't their favorite. Learning to, um, to understand that this is something that they have to do. It's part of their schoolwork and it's part of life. Um, and, and learning how to take those breaks and reward themselves. So I can't answer a specific time. It's a conversation to have with the student. And um, I think, and I think teachers can have these conversations with students too. I think it's important. Um, and all students kind of grapple with these sorts of things. Um, and all people do too, which is again, I know a theme I keep um, repeating, but these sorts of challenges, I think are things that we all struggle with in one way or another, some more severely than others um, and with students as well. But I think the more that we're, we're self-aware and we have that, that mirror that we're holding up to ourselves about our own mental energy levels and how much we can take at one time, um, I think is really important. Um, she says, my son has several ways that his teachers okay. communicate with him and okay. post assignments. He's having trouble keeping up with and knowing what needs to be done and when, and when is it due. So yeah. her question is, do you have any suggestions for a way to capture all the communications and to organize them in real time so he doesn't have to repeatedly check back. Yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, I actually literally just encountered this with a student. Um, sometimes these portals and, and what teachers are posting, like there's just a lot. <laughs> uh, and I know I'm not faulting the teachers for that. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes in a course there's a lot going on. And while I do think these portals do help with organization. I have encountered often that students, they don't know, even know where to look for the nightly homework. Um, and there's just several different things. There's a long-term project, there's a project that's due tomorrow. Um, so I completely empathize with this and I see this sort of thing come up. This is something to definitely talk about um, with the teacher. I'm assuming that's, that's a question from a parent. So this is definitely a conversation to have with the teacher, um, definitely, and again, students should really advocate for themselves in this, but if a parent has to intervene and kind of be part of this conversation, talking to them about, you know, an accommodation for your child or your student in which um, things can be made more clear. So even when it comes to like the nightly homework, 
it sometimes might be hard for a student just to find what it is due tonight right now. Um, again, ideally, teachers are streamlining their portal and they've, they've gone through with students where to look for them. Sometimes those portals are difficult to navigate and there's just kind of a lot going on. So this is definitely, this is a collaboration that teachers need to have with student parents. Certainly if the parent is involved in helping or if the student has a tutor or an educational therapist helping. And again, these are conversations I've had with teachers. Um, everyone who's involved in the homework process needs to be involved in this to discuss how to streamline this. You know, if this is a problem that there's kind of too much being thrown at a student, you know, visually in these portals, and that's just the way the teacher sets up the class, I do think it's important that the teacher recognize that this is challenging for the student and to somehow streamline this process for them. Um, you know, whether it's sending an, an individual text to the student with just, here's your nightly task, here's what you could be working on next week, you know, even just simple. I know teachers are, are taxed and this is a difficult and challenging situation. Maybe it's just the teacher has a quick two minute um, interface with the student through video in which you know, they just quickly go over what the student has for, to, for the night. Again, I know this is all you know, extra stuff for teachers, but you know, when you have students that have these sorts, uh, are struggling, you know, reach out to the families and families reach out to the teachers and, and figure out how you can best support each other and figure out how to streamline that process. I can't give any more specifics on that because I would need to kind of see the portal and see how it functions. But um, I think it's something to discuss with the teacher. Okay, so now we'll get to um, the final question of the evening. And that is, despite the organization um, that mom has set up as far as, you know, a clear workspace, having a desk, um, and the child that we're talking about is nine years old, to give you some oh, okay. context. Oh, younger student. Okay. Um, she says he's always move. He always moves to the floor or lies to stretch us out. Um, of course, he sits up when she walks in the room, but he's pretty much lounging. I, I'm assuming while he's doing his schoolwork. Um, and so she's asking about tips there. She's like, "Is this a bad thing? Even if he's listening to the yeah. teacher and he's participating?" That's a great question. Um, I'm even going to answer this by backing up some years. Okay. There was a time when I started to getting into education 15 years ago, when I was supporting students in inside classrooms that even 15 years ago, teachers, I didn't see teachers allowing students to, to get up and walk around the room during lessons or to even stand. Right. So we've always felt like a student is in a classroom. They need to sit, right. They need to sit upright. It's partly a respect thing, et cetera, et cetera. And then one year, and this is a long time ago at this point, um, I saw that there was a student walking around the room and I spoke to the teacher about it. And she was like, yeah, yeah, we, they, we talked to the parents. The student prefers to learn whilst walking around the room. And she allowed him to do it. And he was the only one who did it. Um, no other students felt like, well, why is he walking? Or I want to get to walk. Students who need that sort of um, accommodation and it works better for them. The teachers are now typically allowing that sort of thing. Right? We're, not, we're kind of out of that phase where we're you know, insisting that students sit upright in a chair. Now, obviously posture and what's good for one's back is again, I'm not an expert and I'm not even gonna go there. So that's certainly something to consider. But if your student who's lounging, if that helps him or her in a sensory way, I mean, the student is, you know, might be doing it because it's sensory seeking, right? They, something about lying on their back or lounging helps them to focus. Um, again, we can't assume that if a student isn't looking at you or if a student is lounging or listening to music while they work, we can't assume that these things are distracting. Um, uh, they might be, they might be. So your child might be doing that as a way to avoid the work, I don't know. If he or she is not, and this is something that actually helps him or her, I would talk to the teacher about it and look, the student, is listening to you, you might not see him or her on the video screen and it might feel a little disrespectful that they're lying down, but truthfully, this is helping the child to, to listen and be attentive. So that's the key here. Again, as far as like posture and all that, you know, that's another issue. But um, as far as this possibly being um, a sensory seeking thing, um, or perhaps the student doesn't want to be on camera, is that a reason why? he or she might be doing that, if we're talking about during like a live Zoom. 
Um, some students might even prefer, you know, again, lying while they're typing or reading. I mean, how many of us lie in bed and read, right? Um, it's, it just might be more conducive to, to again, their sensory and their um, processing of incoming information. So something to discuss with the student, why they're doing it. Um, and if they do need that sort of accommodation and a teacher, um, you can talk to the teacher about that being okay, um, that they just might not be on camera. And again, it might appear disrespectful, but that's not the intent. Um, these are conversations to have with your child and the teacher. Okay, thank you. This will conclude our Q&A for the evening. I want to give a, a special thank you to you, Ezra, for joining us tonight and giving us a wonderful presentation and answering those questions. Thank you.